I can tell that I am not in Australia anymore because you are all here one time and many of you were very early and such a thing does not happen in Australia. So <laughs> thank you very much for coming and uh, I'm glad to see you here for uh, the trolley problem. This is me. Uh, you can take a picture of this and follow me on all my socials or connect to me on them. Or if you are very eager, um, I do have these. Uh, and these are little key rings or badges that I have made. They have NFC chips inside them, which has my, uh, my link tree details on them. So they are my business cards, but they are much prettier. I <laughs> I have not locked them, so therefore after you have taken all the details, you can reprogram them with a little app called NFC Tools. And then you can put your own details on and use it as your own business cards. I do not have enough for everyone here, so I don't know how we're going to manage that. <laughs> cool. Okay. What I am going to talk about today, uh, the trolley problem. How many of you have heard of the trolley problem? Oh, really? So not, not even half, or it could be that those that didn't put their hands up are very shy. It <laughs> could also be that. Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk about that and give you a few examples as to what it is. My degree many, 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 many years ago was in philosophy, and I specialized in ethics and moral philosophy. So therefore, I, I learned about the trolley problem back then and have always found it very interesting. Today, it's a lot more applicable because AI has leapt forward in leaps and bounds. And uh, yeah, we're going to talk about how it applies in the modern world. I'm going to talk a little bit about autonomous vehicles, or as we like to call them in Australia, driver assist cars. They like to call it like that so that you can say definitely the driver was at fault. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about our responsibility to build responsibly, uh, about object recognition and what we do with it. Uh, show you a little demo about how easy it is to train and deploy the model and some things to think about. I am easily distracted and can get off topic quite easily because this, this is a very fun topic. So uh, if you think I'm waffling, you know, like maybe you could just like give me a sort of like move it on, Michelle. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> what is the trolley problem? So it is a thought experiment in ethics and it's a fictional scenario that's shows there is an onlooker and he has a chance to save the lives of five people uh, who will are in danger of being hit by an oncoming train or tram. So not this kind of trolley. Uh, a trolley uh, is a train or a tram. Um, by diversing it to the other line. And on the other line, there is just one worker who ha has an existing worker order for the work that he was doing. The, one, the five on the other line are, I don't know, they have been placed there by a kidnapper who has tied them to the tracks in a nefarious scenario. I should say, you're looking very serious, I should say, I was born in England, and there we have a sense of humour that is very dry and sarcastic, and then I've moved to Australia, I've been there for 10 years, and there we are very casual, and we'll say scandalous things for humour. <laughs> And so if you're looking at stuff that I'm saying and thinking this girl is a sociopath, we should have her committed. <laughs> Please try to remember that, you know, I've been brought up in an uncultured background, but that <laughs> inside I hope I am as gentle as a Norwegian. So you will forgive me, I hope. <laughs> okay, so this kind of trolley is what we're talking about. And this I know you have because I have seen them outside, although they are blue. So the trolley problem is that we are pitting the idea of responsibility against the measurement of good by an end result. So for example, the trolley is going down the tracks. There are five people tied to the tracks. If I pull the lever, it will move to the other track and it will hit the, the rail worker who is there with his existing work order. Now, it's not his fault. All things being well, um, it would go down and it would not hit him. He would do his work and it would not hit him. But 
I have a chance to switch it over so that I can save five lives instead of one. Maybe you could give me an idea. Who would save five lives by pulling the lever? Okay. And then, would the rest of you um, not pull the lever and let those five die? Yes? Okay. So the two schools of philosophy that we are talking about there are uh, utilitarianism, which says the greatest happiness of the greatest number is the most important thing. If we have a chance to save five, we should do that. That's, that is how we judge things. Uh, the other school is deontological, and they argue that any action is inherently right or wrong regardless of the consequences. So the fact that you are pulling a lever, that you are actively causing the death of that one person, is a worse thing. However, <laughs> there are, you see I'm laughing, it's not, it's not because I'm a sociopath. <laughs> um, however, there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of complexities within these things. There are those that would go deeper into that deontological thought and would say that, um, in fact, whether you take an actual action or not, you are actively deciding. You are deciding that you will stand by and let five people die so that you have not done anything to murder the one. But nevertheless, those five people are dead because of your lack of action. And so therefore, that's on you. <coughs> oh, sorry, that's very loud. <laughs> um, yes, the thought does make us all cough. Okay, <laughs> so there we go. There's just some thoughts to think of. Um, oh, Philippa Foote, she made it even worse. She said, let's say, forget about the lever. Let's say we're standing on a bridge over the railway line and we are standing next to a very big fat man and we could just push him onto the tracks and then he would definitely stop the train. So <laughs> we definitely saved the five people, but we have really committed an active act of murder in order to save those five. Um, anyone, anyone willing to do that? <laughs> this is where we separate the sociopaths from. <laughs> but, I mean, philosophically speaking, it, it can be the same thing, right? There is still one person for five. You know, um, and in a, in a doctor scenario in the hospital, we put this as you have five patients that are dying. Uh, one healthy person walks in off the street. We could take that one person's organs and save these five. Uh, you know, is that okay? Probably, n probably not. <laughs> I shouldn't be saying probably. <laughs> <laughs> I was okay, I did this talk in Melbourne, and I was okay doing it in Melbourne, because Australians, they are callous, they are heartless people. <laughs> but I'm a little anxious with you all here. <laughs> okay, modern trolley problem. This is a predator zone, drone. No, in fact, it's not. I mean, it's a drone. But predator drones have changed modern warfare. In, they were introduced in the 1990s and they changed the way that the US fights wars, for better and for worse. Because on the one hand, it keeps US troops out of harm's way, but it also removes them from in-the-moment decisions of war. Uh, predica predator strikes can be extremely precise, but they have killed hundreds of civilians. And when I say hundreds, it could be thousands, it could be tens of thousands. This information is not available to us. So um, it's, it's quite a hotly contested topic because, well, you can see why, because. And so what are we going to talk about today? The modern trolley problem in terms of uh, tech and in terms of AI uh, is, uh, I guess, autonomous vehicles. Um, so in an unavoidable crash situation, where does the programming tell the car to go? Do we brake and swerve into pedestrians, into a wall, off a bridge? 
do we ask the algorithm to calculate the path of least damage? Do we tell the algorithm to preserve the people inside the car at the cost of all others? Uh, is that different country to country? These are all, these are all things to think about. And I had initially put, who do I kill? Whereas I realized the proper way to say it is, how, who do I save? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, is the value of one person worth more than the value of another person? So, in some countries, the, uh, the elderly are highly revered, and to save someone who is elderly would be absolutely the, the right thing, the best thing to do. Um, in another country, if there was a small child, a small, cute little child, they are the future, they are the hope, then it would be better to save that one and get rid of those useless old people. Oh, <laughs> that's one of the things I'm not supposed to say. <laughs> uh, maybe I could uh, bring you all in on it as well. Who would, um, who would pick the old people over the, the, the young people? Are you old people that are putting hands up? <laughs> Who would, who would pick the little baby? Oh, yeah, they are so adorable, yes. <laughs> I've seen a few around here today looking really cute, and they get all the swag because they can just ask for it, and no one can bear to say no. <laughs> Wait, I should say, see, do you like my socks? <laughs> These are Azure Function socks. So <laughs> if you go to the Microsoft stand, they have a lot of different socks. <laughs> Okay, so in some countries, who to save is more obvious or it is a different thing than in other countries. Um, I would say probably in, in the US, you would get a lot more people saying, save me, me. I am the primary person. Me, the driver, or me, the passenger in my autonomous vehicle, I am the one that you should save, and I do not want you to swerve to avoid other people if there is any risk to danger of myself. Unless I'm going to get sued for hurting them. Um, in that case, it's kind of like a cost-benefit analysis. Uh, do they look like a rich person or not? <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing it again, aren't I? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. The greater good. Um, so that's the initial premise. Save the greatest number of people and sacrifice one for the greater good. But in that, in that initial scenario, that one rail worker, he had his work order signed off. And it was not, you know, he was supposed to be there. And the other people were not supposed to be there. Um, in this case, there can be a bunch of people on the tracks trying to get their Instagram or TikTok stories. Uh, they're also not supposed to be there. Is the train driver supposed to slow down to avoid killing a bunch of idiots who are on his tracks? Um, I believe it looks like this every single day. And so that would be, yeah, that must be very hard for those people. Um, also, can an autonomous car be programmed to judge people's intentions? So, you know, does it know that they are idiots as opposed to just accidentally careless? <laughs> yeah, we make it harder and harder for the programmers, right? <laughs> okay, into it then. What is a self-driving car? So. Self-driving car is a wonder of modern AI technology. It's capable of detecting its surroundings and functioning without any human intervention. It should be able to go to a preset location without human intervention on roads that have not been adapted for its usage. Do you, do you all have some self-driving cars here? Maybe. Yes. And you have, are they? <laughs> Are you allowed to let the car drive itself without having your hands on the wheel? No. no. And so, yes. So this is how it is in Australia, I guess, as well. They are 
defined as drive assistance vehicles, but your hands should be on the wheel at all times. You should not be watching Netflix movies on the screen. You should be paying attention. And if something goes wrong and you didn't press the brake, even though the car is perfectly capable of pressing the brake, it's your fault. Um, however, we do have some self-driving cars. We do have... Um, in the city of Perth where I live, we have uh, some buses that go on a, a defined route, but they do still have a driver there. But yeah, they are absolutely capable of doing it themselves. So, but this is what we really want, right? We want to take the driver out of the car. We want it to be like the sci-fi movies. We want to be watching Netflix or we want to be sleeping. We don't want to have to do any work because we are lazy. Um, and so what would need to happen in order for us to be confident to do that? So the technology must advance to a degree of safety and security that it can be relied on. I think we are. I think we are already there. Um, but humans, this is the key, humans must have that confidence that in case of an accident, a human driver could not have done it better. I personally already am there. <laughs> uh, Microsoft, it takes responsible AI very seriously, and we have created a bunch of guidelines, of packs, of tools, of workbooks, of all sorts of things to help you when you are building your AI technology to make sure that you have considered all of the things that you need to consider. So I have some links at the end that you can take all of that stuff and use it. It's really, really good. It means you don't have to start from scratch thinking of all of these things for yourselves. You can just use that and then fill it in responsibly for your own company. This is why I say I think it's not the technology's fault. I think the technology is there. We reached human parity on all of these cognitive services many years ago. So it's already better than us, and it gets better every day. Unlike me, I get worse every day. My eyesight is degenerating. I am so tired so much of the time. My concentration is not what it used to be. Uh, although I don't think that's just because I'm getting old. I also have um, my young, younger colleague, and she, her concentration is not there either, but that's because she has 60 tabs open in her brain at all times. <laughs> so, yes, I personally think the tech is, is better than I am, but it isn't the technology on its own that does the work. There's a lot of other components that go into that programming, into the training of those models, and into operationalizing the AI that do rely on us uh, lazy and deficient human beings to uh, do some work. So yes, we have to be sure that how we use it, we train it, the data we feed it, how we test it, how we implement it, how we improve it, those feedback loops, all of those things are considered from every angle and well done, because it is people's lives that can be uh, directly and inversely impacted. Yes, uh, this is what we want though with the self-driving cars, right? We want to be sleeping. Um, but when, whenever there is an accident with a driver assist car at the moment, the first thing I always do is I look for the, the post-incident review. I look for the report, what does it say? Who is to blame? And it will mostly always say that the human driver was to blame. The hands were not on the wheel. They were not watching. They were watching a movie, something like that. How would it definitely be the car's part and, and not the driver's fault? Would be, I guess, uh, if the log showed that the car sped up whilst approaching the target. I mean, the victim. Um, <laughs> sped up instead of slowed down. Or... Um, or maybe one of the parts failed, or one of the sensors failed, or it showed that there was an obstruction or something like that that prevented it from accurately doing its job. Now, I did want to briefly talk about this. Um, where I said it's us, it's always our fault. It's always the human's fault. 
we, we have some fantastic cognitive services that everyone could spin up and use very easily. The facial recognition stuff was really, really good. And it was used in so many cases for uh, finding lost children, finding lost children who had been lost when they were four and were now like 14, because you also use the AI to age what would the child look like. Um, people trafficking, for uh, people being kidnapped in crowds, all sorts of really good use cases for facial recognition. However, since 2020, that notice was up there about the US police force not being allowed to use that service because they did not use it responsibly. They did not use it well. They did not train it well. It was, uh, well, uh, for an example, it, there was not a good training set of people of color and so therefore it would identify that black man as the black man that did the crime whereas in fact to it all black men were that black man so <laughs> with the right training data it would absolutely have been able to do an excellent job but they did not the cost and the time involved in training that was too much for them and so we stopped them using it that was okay since 2020. We, you know, we look for cases where people are not using it well and take it away if they are doing it. But earlier this year, we decided it was not enough. People were not by default using stuff well. And so therefore we have reversed the scenario. So now no one can use it unless they put a use case in showing they have considered all of those principles. And once they have justified that, then they are able to use it, which I think is very sad for people like us who would like to try it, test it, play with it, and you know have some fun. And also for all of those people who were using it for good, it's added extra layers in there. But yeah, if people are not using stuff well, I guess they have no choice. So these are the responsible AI principles. Um, Let's see, I need to speed up because I am going, <laughs> I'm going too slow. Here we go. So we start with fairness. Um, fairness in AI systems mean that it should treat everyone fairly and avoid affecting similarly situated groups of people in different ways. So for example, you think about medical treatment, loan applications, employment, and you want to make the same recommendations to everyone with similar symptoms, financial circumstances, or professional qualifications. There are inherited biases in the data. So for example, one of the most famous cases is a big tech company decided that they would take the bias out of their employment process by removing people from the decision making at, first, at the first level. And they would just feed the data to the machine and let it choose who should go through to first line interviews. Uh, what happened was, <laughs> if you just do that and you're using data that is based on biases in the past, well, the machine judged that all the successful candidates were straight white men. And so therefore, all the best candidates must be straight white men. So it immediately, in the first round, cut out all the women and people of color. <laughs> <laughs> so the biases were in the data, not in the tech, and not really in the people that were making the first thing. So you have to, you have to think, you have to judge, and you can also do something called feature tuning, where you can tell it stuff like gender should not be a thing that you judge on. Age maybe should not be a thing that you judge on. Color should not be a thing that you judge on. Look on these other features as your primary decision makers. Um, I am not a trained data scientist, but uh, this stuff is uh, is all there in the docs, and it's very yeah very interesting, very easy for you to get an idea as to what you should be thinking about and what you should be looking for. Okay, which way do I swerve? Which way do I swerve? So let's assume we are this close, so we're definitely going to hit. So I need to turn the wheel as well. Which way should I go? Do we save the dog or the woman? <laughs> it's a real tough choice, I think. <laughs> okay, 
reliability and safety. This is the thing that most of the public are concerned about when they are thinking about self-driving cars. They assume that the tech and the, the hardware is not there uh, or not good enough. But in fact, um, year after year since the invention of the car, all of these things have been getting better and better. Um, do you all know about what happened when airbags were first introduced? Uh, airbags uh, killed a lot of women and children, in fact, more than they saved, because the airbags were tested on people in the factories who built the cars, and people in the factories who built the cars were mostly quite strong men. And so therefore, the pressure that those airbags came out at was too strong for a lot of women and children, and it crushed their rib cages. I shouldn't have said that with such relish. Um, <laughs> so it is important that when you are testing, you have a diverse data set and you have a diverse range of test candidates. Uh, not just for the, um, the actual actions, but the uh, diversity of thought is interesting there as well. Have people who can see things from different perspectives. Who recognizes these algorithms? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah, so these are quite my favorites. And I think that they should apply not just for autonomous cars and for robots, but in fact, for all of us. We should really be trying not to kill other human beings or to hurt each other at all, unless fighting for our lives. Um, we should be trying to protect each other. We should be trying to help each other. And you know, these are principles that we can live our lives by. So, oh yeah, I should have said, for those of you that do not recognize them, these are Asimov's Laws of Robotics. It's a very famous um, science fiction stroke fantasy series about robots. Um, maybe Will Smith played a, a, a in it a movie called iRobot. So yeah, super, super good books, and it really does make you think about the philosophy behind how you teach the machines what they need to know in order to uh, protect people's lives. Uh, this is me going to the airport. I mean, it's not, but it looks like it looks to me. When I drive to the airport at three in the morning and it's pouring with rain, in Australia, in Perth, we are not used to the rain. We don't know what it looks like. So when it falls from the sky, we are baffled and confused. <laughs> and uh, three in the morning when it's raining like this, there's probably road work, so those lights, like these lights, are shining directly into the window through the rain. And I've forgotten to put my glasses on. This is a very traumatic experience. This is very bad. And I think if I had the opportunity to tell the car to take the wheel, it would be a million times safer than me clutching my wheel like this and shaking with fear as I drive. Um, that's not the only time that I would be more dangerous than the car itself. I would think very tired at the end of the day. I used to, in the UK, drive all the way to Scotland and all the way back, back down in a day. Very tired, very, uh, or maybe I've been arguing with someone. There's a lot of things that can throw you off your game, whereas the car is never tired and the car is never off its game. In fact, it sees things pixel by pixel. Uh, as opposed to the, the blurry way that I see the world without my glasses on. Um, so I think it has the ability to be a lot more precise than us. These are the common applications of computer vision. And these are, um, yeah, this is super fun. If you're interested in, in learning about this kind of thing and you haven't seen it before, it's actually like straight away in the Microsoft AI Fundamentals course. It's, it's in there and you can start building stuff right away. Um, I put a link to that at the end as well. Uh, what we have here, image classification. So it, it is labeling that as a taxi. It knows that's a taxi or it's a car or it's a bus or it's a cyclist. Uh, in the next one, object detection, you see there are bounding boxes around those objects that it has detected as those things. Um, the next one, though, is probably more what you want for the precision of semantic segmentation, because pixel by pixel, it has identified what is a bus, what is a car, what is a cyclist. Um, 
image analysis, if you're using PowerPoint, for example, and you put a picture, an image into your PowerPoint, it will now attempt to label that for you. It will put the alt text in for you. You can still edit that in case it's got it wrong, but it's really, really useful, I think. And it's using AI to do that. Face detection and recognition we have talked about, but it is, I mean, that's what Windows Hello uses to let me into my laptop. And it could tell the difference between me and my identical twin sister. Uh, optical character recognition, this is my favorite one. When I was in university, you had to make notes with a pen and paper. I'm not sure if you're familiar with those, you younger people. <laughs> um, whereas now, you can, you can get the notes, or you can take a picture of the notes from the screen. You can paste that into your OneNote, right-click on it, and say, take text from image, and all the text is there, and it's done it for you. There's no laboriously handwriting stuff. <laughs> Magic of AI. <laughs> These are the ones specifically that we'd be using for um, obstacle avoidance cars. So we'll be using the object detection. You see those bounding boxes there. But also, you can see underneath there what the semantic segmentation looks like in uh, for a self-driving car. You have the object recognition, where it will classify what the different things are. Object localization, I haven't mentioned, but it's looking at where it, the car, is in relation to other things in the world around it. How far it is from different things, what it is close to, and movement prediction is where it is looking for what is that cyclist likely to do? What is that car likely to do? What is that pedestrian likely to do? So you can see the self-driving car in comparison to me, the human in the car, it has a lot more, a lot more sensors, radars, probably compute. <laughs> <laughs> depending on the time of day and how many coffees I've had. But anyway, you see that I am quite a small thing with limited um, vision, whereas the self-driving car is not. Now, I did make a little demo of my own. This is my ultimate robot. Um, this ultimate robot, it has some, a couple of Raspberry Pis to control its movement. Inside is an Azure Percept device, which is an IoT Edge device that it uses to, um, to, <coughs> to see and to um, judge what it's going to do. So this is what the Percept device sees based on the training that I've given it. So I have trained it to look for cones and identify the cones and identify uh, Lego men. Ideally, the proper way to be doing this is just train it for the cones, just one thing, and give it, you know, hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of images of that one thing in different scenarios. That's the proper, what a proper data scientist would do. I, however, <laughs> uh, lack the patience and uh, was excited by the idea of um, giving a little bit more risk to those Lego men. So I have been, <laughs> been more reckless. Let's have a look at the, um, here we go. So this is me demoing how we train the model. I have recorded it so that we can skip to the good parts because um, while the model would be training, that can take quite a little amount of time, but it's super, super easy. Is it clear enough? Can you see all the, can you see the categories? So, what you can see here is you can literally start, you fill things in. It's not so important. What you call things, I mean, obviously give things meaningful labels, but it's, it's initially when I was trying to play with all of these things, I thought that was probably more critical than it is. In fact, after you have built it many times, then you realize as long as it's something unique, it's fine. Uh, the other thing that I'm doing here is I am, in my laziness, just picking about 15 images because 15 is the minimum number of images that you need in order to train a model. Now, um, one of the Microsoft MVPs that taught me how to do this, he trained on 100 images. 100 images is a reasonable little test pilot. Uh, 15 images is not. 
So, <laughs> but probably with the 100, he also thought he was being lazy because you would never go to production with 100 images. So <coughs> there we go. And this is just to show that it's pretty easy to just um, click on the things in the image and then label them. So we're labeling those as cones. Uh, again, you can see I'm pretty lazy there in that the box is not including the, the base. If I was doing this properly, I would have expanded the box so that the whole cone was inside the box. However, in this demo, I am just letting it go with what it's done and putting those in there. What you really want is, as you see here, it's taking them from different angles and it's taking them on different surfaces, on different backgrounds. And to do that with hundreds of images, then you would really start to trust your data a lot more. To do it with hundreds of thousands, you would start to trust your data a lot more. But you're all thinking that would be pretty boring, right? Doing it like this, labeling it one by one. Uh, however, once you have the 15 trained, uh, there is an automated way to do that. So you see my laziness um, will pay off in a little bit. I will perhaps... I was going to say I will perhaps move that on a bit. With the uh, Lego people, because I realised initially that if I was just putting Lego men in there, uh, perhaps that was not a diverse enough field, and so I should put Lego people in. Um, there are not many uh, Legos of colour. What I have is pretty much uh, blonde girls and um, star troopers in masks who could be anything under there. So we're going to allow that maybe, maybe some of the superheroes are, are not blondes. Yeah, you see on the, um, when you're clicking, it will like click a little bit of it and you can expand it to be the whole thing. This is the longest uh, recording thing that I have. I'm going to move it along a little bit here. So this is the bit where I have already skipped to the good part because this training, even for only those 15 images, would take a little bit longer. Uh, but it's still not that long. You would be able to do this whole thing within half an hour, I would say. And then this is the kind of precision recall and map uh, that you have. This is not good enough really, I would say. So you don't want to go to production with this. I think you know that, huh? So we try to put some more in there. What happened here is uh, that image is sideways and it didn't recognize any of them at all, which <laughs> is not great because in some of them I have put the, um, I have put them on the floor, which they would be if they were, you know, knocked over by an obstacle avoidance vehicle. So it should recognize them as still Lego people in that scenario, and it didn't. Let's go. So then I added a bunch more. And, ooh, did I already do the... See this little button here, guess, get suggested objects? So when you add a bunch more, you can click on that button and it will automatically then try and define what is a cone and what is a person. And you can then correct it. So you can go check it and you can click confirm on each photo or you can, um, or you can take them out. So there we go like that. 
And then that's what it looks like as it is identifying each of those as Lego people. And then I am clicking on confirm suggested objects. See there, I didn't click the, the one lying on the ground. That's me being lazy again. I should have uh, got the bounding box around that guy and said he's a Lego man as well. And so my laziness is definitely going to impact the object detection properties of my obstacle avoidance car. So I've remembered to do it for the rest of them, <laughs> which is good for them. Skip along. And so it, like, it's a little better than after those. However, what you see here, uh, 25 Lego people and 15 cones. Ideally, for a balanced model, you want the same number of people and cones in there. And so there it's doing a little test and it's checking and it identified him as a Lego man, but it wasn't like super confident, 60 something percent. Cool. Let's go next, privacy and security. Now this, this is an interesting thing and a difficult thing in that we all care about our privacy and security, right? We don't wanna give away our data to Facebook, to Optus, to anyone who uh, might let our data be at risk. Um, however, the more information that you give to a model, the better it is going to be at predicting stuff about you. Um, so there is that tension between what it is, <coughs> what it needs and what we want it to get, what is the right thing to ask for, how much is too much. For us in Microsoft, they tell us not to gather anything these days. Don't gather anything unless you definitely need it and definitely don't save it because the legalities around taking that data are just too much hard work. But in this case, where you're talking about saving people's lives, uh, yeah, that's interesting. So I don't know how they are in this country, but here, this car, it has an onboard computer that will check the license status, outstanding warrants, the photo ID of the driver. Um, it also has mobile fingerprint technology uh, in the car, so if they stop you. Um, it has front and rear cameras, and it records non-stop footage to a fireproof, tamper-proof safe in the trunk of the car. Uh, those two cameras can be live images to, um, to a police operations center in the case of a, a chase. Um, there's three automatic number plate recognition cameras that will detect unregistered cars. Um, there's drug testing equipment. I mean, like I could go on and on. There's really a lot of stuff in here. This seems like a lot of stuff. And if that streamed data, that recorded data is all being stored and all being kept, what would happen in the case of a breach there? There is safety and there is security of the nation, but there is also other considerations around our privacy. Uh, inclusiveness, this one I very much like because the older I get, the more I feel like I need more and more stuff to make things accessible and easy for me to use. But in fact, making things easy for people with disabilities is making things easy for me to use, especially as my eyes get worse and my legs get worse and my bones get worse. Um, I shouldn't have to think about it from a me perspective. It should be that we are thinking about how do we make the world more inclusive and better for everyone. Uh, but as you do make it more inclusive, you do make it better for everyone. That includes you. So these two underlying things that we have at the bottom, we have transparency because where people do not understand how the AI works, then they do not trust it. And if they do not trust it, it doesn't matter how good it is. If they don't believe it, if they don't understand it, then they will not use it and they will not accept it. And they also cannot identify 
whether there is progress being made on those four principles that I mentioned before if they don't understand how the systems work. So <sighs> transparency is really like the you know, one of the most key things that you need to think about when you are doing your responsible AI, transparency and fairness, I guess. And as I mentioned before, there are absolutely ways. In the past, people would say there's a black box technology here. We can't tell you. We don't understand how the AI made its decisions. That is not good enough. Um, you absolutely can train your machines using automated machine learning, and but you can get it to tell you what the explainer. You can get it to use an explainer model and to tell you what the algorithms were that it chose in order to make its decisions. You can also do feature tuning, as I said, pick certain things above certain other things in order to say these are the important things, and you should. The goal should be that you could explain it to your mum. <laughs> how, the, how it works, because if you cannot explain it to your mum, then people are not going to accept this as uh, legitimate. Okay, here is a, a little um, <coughs> live stream as to what my Percept device looked like when it was doing its obstacle avoidance. So I trained it initially to avoid the safety cones. I did not tell it to do anything with the Lego people. I just said avoid the safety cones. Um, so here it is. After, so before I deployed the model, it just had a general model on there so it could see books, but didn't know what cones and Lego men were. Then I deployed the model, and it recognizes the cones and the Lego men. Uh, on the other side, you see what the Raspberry Pi is telling me from the telemetry. So what it's recognizing in terms of cones and Lego men and the percentage. Now, it has unfortunately identified Leo the lion as a Lego man, and you can see that he has reached the conclusion as it mows down those Lego men that it is now targeting him, and the best decision would be to exit the vicinity. <laughs> so I did not tell it to kill the Lego men. I simply told it to avoid the Lego canes. So there was no direct intent to hurt Leo the lion, and also, you know, if I had not been so lazy with my training, um, it would have identified that he was not a Lego man as well. So there's a lot of things that I did there in my laziness that caused Leo some concern. <coughs> and he held me accountable for that. This is the key thing with AI and responsible AI. Someone is always accountable. And who is that person? Let's see, who is to blame? There's a lot more people than you might really think about. So um, <coughs> data scientists would be one of them. For example, if you have not got enough data of what people look like in different types of people, different colors of people, different heights of people, and in different backgrounds, in different levels of light, in, in all of that, and you haven't fed all of that information into your model, then that's a problem. Uh, maybe, the, maybe the part has failed, so maybe the manufacturer is at fault. Maybe the people that put it together, or the robots that put it together under the supervision of people, uh, maybe those, there was something wrong with the manufacturing process. Uh, maybe the drivers are um, intentionally driving recklessly. Uh, maybe pedestrians, maybe someone jumped out in front of the car. Uh, or, yeah, maybe the um, programmer did something. Um, I do have an example of that in an upcoming slide. I just wanted to show the code. So if you want to play with this stuff yourself, the templates and the codes for um, Azure Percept and um, building this kind of thing are super, super useful. You see all the, the purple stroke blue? Those are all the comments explaining what the code will do, explaining how to do it, explaining where to get it, explaining what command line to run. So, you know, there's a lot there to help you build this stuff. And the lines in color are the only bits of code that I then had to change. Um, 
I, that's not enough for me. I am not a fan of using the command line. I would rather, I mean, how many people prefer command line to um, drag and drop clicky things? Yeah, uh, I mean, this is the beauty of Azure, of course. You can, <laughs> you can do it in the command line, you can do it in the portal, you can do it in the portal in the command line, you have many choices, and in fact, you have the same results. And so, but what I like to do is go into the portal and then look for the same pieces of information as I had to get using the command line so that it's clear in my mind what pieces of information I'm using, what I'm using them for, where I get them from and what I need to change in case uh, something has been breached. So that's like that. Um, and then, yeah, this is the telemetry that we saw on that screen. So when you're testing, of course, it's good if you can have the telemetry come up so you can see what is the machine doing, why is it going after Leo the lion. Um, and this <coughs> is a problematic piece of code in that uh, my colleague George, he did put in a, a command to kill the Lego men. You can see that it is commented out. However, I don't think that would help us in a court of law <laughs> because uh, that code is, well, it's, then, it's there commented out or not. It would be in the source control. People would see that there was an intention to kill the Lego men at some point and they would question our ethics. So even in fun, you want to be careful of what you are putting in your code and act responsibly. So here is just a little view as to what the um, what the percept is seeing from behind and from the front. So here in this case, I had um, asked it to avoid everything, and it has done its best to avoid both the men and the cones. It has turned slightly towards the cones because there was no way to make it through this scenario without taking someone out and it has chosen the cone very wisely. <laughs> so yes, and look, there is poor Leo in the background as well, wondering how safe he is in this scenario. <laughs> cool, so where I mentioned that there are a whole bunch of uh, standards and toolkits and templates and things that you can use. This was, um, we released like all more of this stuff because those, you know, responsible AI principles that I went through were not enough uh, in terms of what people were using it for and how they were using it. So, so these are all there and I've put some links to the things uh, at the end. And I did just want to leave you all with a kind of quote to think about because, yeah, uh, these are the two scenarios to fear uh, where, <laughs> where the algorithm perfectly predicts my future behavior and, and where it imperfectly predicts it. So <laughs> basically, yes, we can, we can always be in trouble unless we have uh, thought, thought these things. So this is the uh, resources screen, you maybe want to take a picture of that so that you can look these things up later. And then I am open for questions if anyone wants any. <laughs> or yes, I also have, I have this many of the little, um, little NFC chips. So yeah. I guess otherwise I could just show you some appendix items. Do you, do you, all, you all remember this one? <laughs> this is a very good Twitter account uh, where he is he is using ethics with Lego. It's mostly the Americans that struggle with this stuff, I think. <laughs> Are there any Americans in the room? <laughs> they would be, <laughs> they would all be speakers. They will feel free to punish me later. Yeah, cool. Does anyone have any questions? 
Yeah, I didn't waffle as much as I thought I was going to. I was really worried that I was going to um, go a lot over because I tend to get sidetracked on topics. Yes. Um, does, no. Because, you know, <laughs> like my bed, oh, I should say it out loud. So he said, um, humans are by nature are very lazy, and this is known. And so you, when you make an autonomous vehicle, you are enabling a human to be even more lazy. And so if they are lazy, because you have provided them the vehicle to be lazy, then aren't, isn't the car, isn't the car at fault? Uh, you know, I would say, well, see, my my bed is not at fault for causing me to nap so much. <laughs> <laughs> we cannot really blame the inanimate objects, or can we blame the intentions of the... Yeah, country by country, I think that there might be some countries that prohibit the use of an autonomous car because they consider that we are not responsible enough to play with those toys. Um, but then, you know, then people also object and say we are adults, we should be able to choose whether we can be trusted to, to with the technology or not. It's a very, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, a difficult topic. You want to come up and choose a, a badge. <laughs> oh. But I have like different choices. Like this is an Xbox. Really? Okay. <laughs> and what about color? Because I have different <laughs> colors. This is <laughs> NDC blue. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Does anyone else want to ask questions now? I am throwing toys out. Well, then my head definitely hurts with that question. It's the rules in the country are we should uh, hit the old person before the baby. Mm -hmm. But as it happened in that year, um, we actually hit a lot of old people, more old people than we wanted to. So they hit the baby in one accident in order to even it up for that year. <laughs> Oh, you see now, I thought I was going to get into trouble. <laughs> yeah, so uh, for the recording, he's asking, should we, um, if, if we have hit more old people than seems publicly acceptable in a year, should we uh, aim the cars towards the babies to try and even out the statistic? <laughs> um, yes, obviously we should. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, statistics are a very dangerous guide for for things, um, and it it is always uh, yeah, it is always interesting to count to count the number of people in the room who said this and who thought that, and then to uh, also get the percentage of those people because often those numbers tell you different tell a different story depending on the spin you put on it. Uh, that's one of the quotes I still remember from my first year statistics. Correlation is not causation. <laughs> and so, and yes, statistics can tell any story you want them to. That is why I think the rise of the data scientist has been so huge, because it's not just about the data that we have, it's an interpretation of the data, and it's about putting a narrative around that interpretation of the data so that you can 
make sense of what is happening with all of the technology and all of the human behaviors and all of the processes and all of the laws, the compliance, the governance, the everything. Uh, yes. So, color preference. Here. <laughs> Mm-hmm. But is that transparency, or is transparency the reasoning behind that is behind the why it is not box there? Yeah, the transparency should is not about the this is what it saw in terms of the the bounding box and it labelled it that. It's what was the what was the training that the model got in order to be in order to be certain and how certain it was. Because normally for those bounding boxes, it's not just saying that's a Lego man or that's a cone. It's saying it's sort of 64% certain it's a Lego man. Um, and so you, yes, then you want to know really the transparency, I guess, is we used hundreds of thousands or millions of images to train it. And the defining properties of those bounding boxes were these things you know it's it's the extra stuff and i guess for the bounding box thing it's not as interesting as when you're talking about loans for example did it reject uh, this boy because he has ginger hair <laughs> as opposed to accepting this man because he looks more responsible with his you know shirt collar like what is the what was the decision making criteria of that uh, of that loan model? I guess what were the features that were the more highly focused? I did have a whole other session where I talk about Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Have you all read that? And in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the answer to life, the universe, and everything is forty two, and it took many millions of years to come up with this answer but then when they asked it but what was the question it said it did not know the question and it needed to build another model to come up with the explainer for the answer and so it was building an, an explainer model uh, which then took many millions of years and was accidentally destroyed oh look they are waving at me i'm over my time okay good if you want some of these come and find me afterwards um, and I will give them to people who do not murder me for being inappropriate. <laughs>